Constantine is a movie that I seem to appreciate more every time that I see it. At least it's nice out. For all the things it tried to do, where it could have just played it safe. Cats are good. Half in, half out anyway. A pre-Golden Age comic book movie about Keanu Reeves fighting half-demons in order to win divine favor and keep himself from going to hell once he inevitably dies of lung cancer. Yeah, that's a good idea. So, yeah, there's a lot I could talk about with Constantine. It's bleak, neo-noir, refreshingly unglamified LA tone. It's once contentious, almost parallel universe interpretation of its Hellblazer source material. The film's frankly admirable blend of practical effects, green screen compositing, CG, and miniature work. Or, you know, all the odd ways in which this movie was basically John Wick a decade before John Wick. But today, for now, I want to focus on a quality of this movie that honestly has always intrigued me the most. The way Constantine, a hundred million dollar comic book movie made by a first time feature film director, handles its exposition, its world building, its delivery of information. Because for a film in the genre, not unlike its namesake, it does its best to not play by the rules. Come on, you don't need its protection. It'll be like back in the day. I think producer Akiva Goldsman described things best when he called this film the sequel to the Constantine movie you never saw. I need to use the chair. He said, this is a film about middles. John. About pre-existing relationships. He's still trying to buy your way into heaven. Characters who go about their business, who already know each other, who have histories with each other, who already understand the world in which they live, and who, frankly, couldn't care less about making sure we as an audience understand every little thing all the time, too. You ever think if you told me more now, maybe I could help out? Huh? Nope. Nope. Of course it's a nope. Why should they? Which way is east? This is their truth, their reality. We're just dropped in the middle of it. Constantine doesn't care that it's a movie. Constantine just is. And that's the challenge. Any movie that's governed by bespoke rules, fantasy, science fiction, superheroes, it has to find some way of making those rules known. Or else we end up confused, disconnected, or with weightless, meaningless conflict and unclear stakes. In a dream, your mind functions more quickly, therefore... The exposition is one solution. Slow. Five minutes in the real world gives you an hour in the dream. Through dialogue, monologuing, the exposition dump... Your life is the sum of a remainder of an unbalanced equation inherent to the programming of the Matrix. It's a brute force inclination, but it's used for good reason. It's low risk, and against the least common denominator... Be immortal? Well, it works. Or to reproduce. But Constantine? For your boss. Let's just say he's disinclined. Hold on! For one, as a protagonist, Constantine not only already knows more than most of the people around him. Things I've beaten. Things most people never even heard of. And therefore doesn't have to have things explained to him. Thanks for the history lesson, Midnight. He also happens to be a character who's particularly disinterested in explaining what he does know. To anybody else. It sounds like a theory detective. Almost satirically so. Good luck. I mean, here's how John Constantine answers a question. Move the car! Why? Move the damn car! If this is some kind of spell or something, don't you need candles and a pentagram for it to work? Why, do you have any? Oh, was it supposed to be hot or cold? In front of the chair. Well, I thought that with your background you could at least Point me in the right direction. Yeah, okay, sure. Then why don't I apprentice something besides driving then, John? John? So what's gonna happen? My dad. And this is as true for the character as it is for the movie at large. Don't ask me if there's water in hell. So water in hell. At least... Sure. Until it really matters. Because... 
concepts and rules and histories, well, they are explained. Angels and demons can't cross over onto our plane. Just not until after they're first shown. So instead, we get what I call half-breeds. I'll deport you, sorry, ass right where you stand, you half -breed. shit. For instance, within the unknown rules of a world where a man can be struck by a car and walk away unharmed, where a girl can be found crawling up her bedroom walls, John Constantine can walk into a room and remain entirely matter-of-fact about it. We can discern just from the way Constantine interacts with his environment and those around him that all this is normal for him, while also observing from the behavior of everyone else that it isn't normal to most people. This is important because it means that when Constantine's behavior changes, and he reacts to something that makes him hesitate, we now know, without exposition, that something within the rules of this world is now considered abnormal. The dynamic is clear, we simply lack the finer details. That is, until a couple scenes later... And yesterday, I saw a soldier demon try to chew its way out through a little girl. And the result isn't so much dumps of exposition as it is clarification. The great detente of the original superpowers. One scene introduces us to an idea. I can get in? If you can get in. What? And then a later scene. If I can get in, it's a bear though, right? Clarifies that idea. Two frogs on a bench. With concrete information. Two frogs on a bench. Sometimes this can work the other way, too, resulting in payoffs. Something can be explained in one scene. <coughs> happens to everyone the first time. This is sulfur. And then used as shorthand later on. Amen! Sulfur. Or take this example of these ideas being sort of layered together. In this scene, we're shown visually what happens when a character crosses over into hell. But it isn't until this scene, where what was shown abstractly gets clarified through dialogue. But when you cross over, time stops. Now, putting these two elements together, time stops. This yet even later scene in the bathtub can now be played like this. In the original shooting script for the film, there was a whole sequence inserted in the middle of this shot that showed Rachel Weiss's character crossing over. Director Francis Lawrence took it out to make her journey there at the end of the movie more impactful, and he could do that because of the shorthand he had established using the complementary nature of the previous two scenes. Now, I won't lie. Nobody's perfect. The dialogue in Constantine can verge on clunky from time to time. You were one witch doctor against one. 30 Ashkar. And this scene in the diner is 100% explainer. But it comes almost exactly at the halfway mark of the film. It doesn't introduce us to a bunch of new ideas. It merely clarifies and answers questions that have accumulated up until this point. Like who Constantine is, what motivates him, and how heaven and hell, angels and demons, operate within the lore of the movie. When we were little. And when the scene does try to expose new information, this is really not so different from any good mystery or detective story. We begin with a question, we're given clues and time to postulate a solution before we're eventually revealed the truth. Constantine may be supernatural in its themes, but it's pure dark naturalism in its execution. The goal, Lawrence says, was to create a movie that the audience to some degree has to reach for, rather than a movie that's constantly reaching for its audience. And that's a fine line to walk with a lot of risk of confusion and disconnect and all the things that most blockbusters fear, but one that can also create a more profound love between film and viewer when that connection is achieved. 
And that's the thing, I think, about movies that go on to be cult films. They're not destined to be loved by all, not least of all the critics, considerate of all the stuff a film gets wrong. They're destined to be remembered by the few, and loved twice over, for all the stuff they managed to do right. Marcus, thank you so much for your generous support and for the suggestion. I'm Danny Boyd. Until next time.